Hello everybody. Uh, I am Tojashu. Uh, I'm back with my uh, with my uh, tutorial classes. And uh, as I had told you before, that uh, I'll be covering my next session on basic clock module. Uh, that's called BS uh, BSC BSCCTL. That's the control register, or you can say BCM. Uh, it's called basic clock module plus. That is, it, it it provides the entire clocking facility to your the microcontroller. And if you look in my previous session uh, of my tutorial of this particular microcontroller, uh, MSP four three X two XX series, um, then you must have seen that I have explained uh, the architecture of the microcontroller. And uh, what is more important is that. Uh, before we move on to the various uh, details of this particular uh, controller and we move on to a project that we have promised to be completed we must understand the basic uh, units that are required to power on and run this kind of microcontroller so the very basic thing on which a microcontroller will always rely on is the clocking module because it's a synchronized machine it's a clock synchronized machine right you supply the club you, you supply a pulse or a square wave or any kind of clocking your device will work if you don't it doesn't it's as simple as that so when you halt the clock or you halt the oscillator your processor goes to a halt so you must know how the clocking functions how the basic clocking functions inside the MSP430 uh, 2xx series and this entire chapter is, is totally about about that thing uh, well the video is a bit boring I hope so for many of you because I will just go through the data sheet but promise you one thing I can promise you is that I won't go into much details because that's your part of the job your your work that you have to do you will have to um, you will have to study a bit uh, and see what more details are given I will just you know explain some basic parts of the basic clock plus module okay so let us start from here now I hope by now you have downloaded the this particular uh, data sheet that is SLAU 144i that is the 2012 version so if you do if you haven't then you can follow the link in my last class over there I provided the link you should download this data sheet it is very 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 important for any any x2 xx series microcontroller that is uh, manufactured by Texas Instruments and uh, it's very handy you don't have to go through the entire of the data sheet it means you but you must know all the kind of basic functions that are done because the basic functions are very important for the microcontroller to power up and you know run simple programs that are already given either inside the resource explorer or in the code composer studio or or maybe your own program so we can see that this entire chapter has uh, three parts as introduction operation and registers so the, the most important part is obviously for the programmers is the registers right so the registers is where you can really configure so for the registers part I'll go on later on the first thing I must tell you is the introduction so let us go directly to the introduction page see as I told you this basic clocking system the basic clocking system has mainly you can say three sources of clock right one is the ACLK as you can see over here I will just make it a bit bigger for you to understand one is ACLK that is called the auxiliary clock the auxiliary clock is used to provide clocking to various parts of the microcontroller when the microcontroller is in deep sleep mode that is in the low power mode then there is MCLK 
that is the memory clock or the main clock or the main system clock this MCLK can be used for the peripherals as well as the core so it is up to you whether you configure in the registers that I will show below that whether you want to use the MCLK or the main system clock uh, for the for the core only or for the core as well as the peripherals but make sure if you're using the MCLK for the core as well as the peripherals then you have to use uh, some kind of uh, methodology um, so that uh, so that um, you know your peripheral works as fast as a core because uh, the core can be you know geared up at around say 1 megahertz or maybe say 12 megahertz and if your peripheral if, say for example your i squared c peripheral that is a serial communication peripheral if the serial communication peripheral doesn't work at such high speed then I'm sorry to say your uh, your high speed is high speed of, uh, uh, clocking of the peripheral is of no use you can you're basically wasting the clocking my suggestion would be to keep the MCLK extensively for the main uh, CPU and maybe some vital functions like the micro DMA or the SRAM and the and the, and the, and the memory part and keep all other peripherals in something else that is I explained in the last class that is called the SMCLK that is a sub main clock or subsystem clock so how do you uh, how do you configure and how do you how do you use all these kind of uh, complicated uh, clocking system for your microcontroller so that is where I will begin first let us see that how many types of clocking is there as I told you that day as I told you that day that there are many type of clocking available you can use many of them one most important clocking system is the very low clock or VLO clock VLO clock is nothing but a very simple RC oscillator with a very 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 uh, low accuracy but you don't need accuracy when the microcontroller is in sleep mode what you just need to do is you know you just gotta ensure that any kind of external interrupt can wake up the microcontroller go to the serve interrupt service routine and do the job that it, that it is supposed to do so very low clock can be one of the clocking system of the auxiliary clock right so <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry uh, so <coughs> this very low clock or VLO clock can be used so you see this block this particular block over here this block as you can see <coughs> as you can see will select between uh, two type of clocking systems that is one is VLO CLK and the other is LFXT1 CLK right so which one of the two you will use will obviously depend on these two lines so basically if I explain then this LFXT1 SX it basically stands for LFXT1 S0 and LFXT1 S1 these are two bits these two squares as you can see over here these two squares below LFXT1 SX these squares are nothing but two bits right so any combination of bit that is say one zero as you can see over here one zero in this in this trapezium in this trapezium this one zero if you put a one and a zero combination over here then this trapezium allows the VLO CLK to move out and then move into the divider right I hope you can understand so putting LFXT1 S0 as 1 that is this first bit and LFXT1 S0 as 0 which is the second bit what you do is you basically allow VLO CLK that is very low clock to move into the divider section of the auxiliary clock now what is the divisor for or the divider for suppose if you want for very low clock this divider is of no use let me tell you frankly but for example if you're using this auxiliary clock for your peripherals 
and if you have a slow peripheral like say a serial communication or or you have an ADC uh, peripheral that is built inside your microcontroller you will you will definitely you know want them to operate at a slower frequency than the mic than, than the microcontroller core for the simple reason that if you're multitasking especially or if you're doing some parallel job processing then you will never want the ADC to overflow before the the, the main the main the main CPU or the ALU uh, comes back to the ADC and picks up the value I hope you can understand suppose if you have two if you have two um, if you have two um, peripheral working parallelly say if you are acquiring some value from the ADC channel 0 and if you are sending that value through the UART that is the universal asynchronous um, receive transmit that is the RS232 port then you will obviously want both the both the peripherals that is the ADC as well as the UART to operate at a lower speed than the CPU core now ask me why the reason is if it so happens that both the peripherals are working at very high speed then there may be a loss of value because maybe the ADC has converted and is ready for con and is for ready for conversion or for the next conversion but the CP but the CPU core has hasn't you know hasn't been ready as yet or is not ready to pick up the value from the ADC and send it to the uh, to the serial peripheral one one option many of you guys might be thinking is why not to use the micro DMA uh, okay fine micro DMA is good you don't need the CPU intervention but for basic students that who are listening to this video for the first time I would say leave aside micro DMA I'm not considering micro DMA now I'm just saying that in this case there's a chance that ADC uh, value will be overwritten by the next read right so unless and until you control the ADC uh, for the for the for, for the next conversion but then again if you if you make the ADC wait then you might lose some value or vital analog data at the input channel of the ADC so you have to divide the auxiliary clock by some value say divide by one means it is as same as that of what is coming from the from the from the clocking pulse uh, but the best option is to divide it by two or four uh, that is suppose if LF LFX T1 CLK is coming at say 16 megahertz and if that is the frequency at which the core is running then definitely you would want the peripherals to operate at one fourth of it that is 4 megahertz so that is the reason why mm, this divisor or the divider part is given now how much you want to divide with is, is again decided with this diva x well this diva x is nothing but diva that is divisor of auxiliary clock bit a that x stands for bit 0 and bit 1 so if you make a combination of 0 0 that means it's divided it's you 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 are you are asking to divide it by 1 if you are using the combination of 0 1 it's as you are you are saying divide it by 2 if you use the combination of 1 0 it means that you want to divide it by 4 and so on right now for VLO CLK this divisor or the div or the divider or the prescaler as many microcontrol manufacturers say is of no use because you will never divide it because the core is not working you don't have any tension but if you're selecting any other here you can see there's one word I'll tell you there's one word called else what is the meaning of the word else over here the else means that any other combination of of this particular bits any other combination of these particular bits say 0 0 or 0 1 or 1 1 will select the second option of the clock that is LFX, LFXT1 CLK now LFXT1 CLK is a standard clock that's a very high um, accurate clock and it can operate uh, from um, two sources one is internally or you can also use an external crystal um, well internally uh, I'm sorry uh, not internally 
uh, with, with internally with capacitors but it can operate from several type of crystals one is you can you can use a clock crystal that is 32.768 kilohertz crystal that you can find in the in the in the, in the RTC chips or in, in the small clock you know you'll find those small crystals in, in the in the clock uh, you can you can you can put that kind of a, that you can put that kind of a um, of a um, crystal over here I'll just show you just wait finding the tool I want you know this is the one I'm saying you know this is the one I'm saying I hope you can understand I don't know how to select this This is the one I'm saying. This one is X in and X out. So these are the two pins which are used for um, for connecting the crystals, right? For 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 the microcontroller that we will use, it will be pins uh, pins P uh, port 2.6 and 2.7. The beauty of the Texas Instrument microcontroller is that you know you can you can if you are not using any external crystal and if you are using internal DCO. Or the, or the internal DC control oscillator then you know you don't have to bother you don't have to bother about these two pins getting wasted which is there in other microcontrollers if you don't use a crystal if you use an external clock source or if you use internal clock source in some microcontrollers what happens is that those two pins goes unwitten you know it, it goes unused so here there is not an option so for LFXT1 CLK you can use either 32.768 uh, kilohertz crystal that is the low frequency crystal well in that case um, there are some special conditions that have to be made now what are those special conditions that have to be made is that there's a there's a there is a particular bit in a register that is called XTS right so the XTS has to be set to zero that is over here this bit has to be zero so if you're using a low frequency crystal you just set a set XTS equals to zero and the entire oscillation frequency will come to your LFXT1 CLK output so if you are selecting the sales option then this 32.768 uh, kilohertz crystal uh, will generate a frequency and that frequency or that pulse will clock pulse will be fed into the divider now your divider will come into use and you can um, you can you can use it uh, for dividing the frequency as you wish now one thing you need to know that is uh, if you're using a low frequency crystal like 32.768 kilohertz then you know the starting capacitors which are used with the crystals you don't have to use external starting capacitors there are settings for using external starting internal starting capacitors and the and the values are selected there are very values many values you can select you can select uh, 6 pf 10 pf 10, 10 picofarad 6 picofarad uh, 12 picofarad and they are configurable using these two bits that is x cap bit 0 the left the left square signifies bit 0 and the right square signifies bit 1 so for all these combinations that is 0 0 0 1 1 0 1 1 of these two bits of x, x cap x will uh, select various starting capacitors so the starting capacitors are um, not required externally but if you are using a high frequency mode that is if this crystal connected to x in and x out right if the crystal that is connected to x in and x out is a high frequency crystal like for example 25 megahertz say which is the highest allowed 
frequency for 2553 the one in the one in which we will be working then uh, then you have to use an external crystal right then x cap x uh, or the internal crystal that is x cap x cap bit 0 and x cap bit 1 will make no sense because um, you need a higher value capacitor like 33 picofarad or maybe 47 picofarad which is not possible to be to be made or constructed inside the die so in that case you have to use an external crystal and this XTS just remember which was zero for the low frequency crystal has to be made one so you have to make this value of XTS equals to one okay and say suppose if you're using a crystal of um, of um, say uh, say um, 20 megahertz right so your output will be 20 megahertz and you use a crystal that is uh, you use a capacitor of say 32 picofarad but your XTS if you put XTS equals to zero then your oscillation will go to a fault mode okay so now next le now let us come to a very beautiful feature of MSP430 is the oscillator off you know this oscillator off this is a nice thing uh, why I'm calling it a nice thing because sometimes it happens that you know the the system that is running from an external crystal it goes to a fault mode the crystal is at fault your system crashes your oscillator goes to halt your microcontroller goes to halt and your entire product is just you know it, it's just it is just not working so uh, when a product fails or, or a product goes dead uh, there are thousand and one reasons why this might happen but if you are able to know the reason then it's it's a boon right so this oscillator off is nothing but a bit um, th this is a bit that keeps uh, you know uh, that can be used to switch off the oscillator and if, if, if the oscillator off is not uh, used like if you are keeping the oscillator on and if still there is a fault if still there is some fault in the in the in the in the clocking section then that will generate that will generate or it will make a flag in the system register to go high and that flag in turn will make a system interrupt if you enable the interrupt that is called the oscillator fault interrupt and that fault interrupt is a non maskable interrupt that is you cannot stop that interrupt from happening once enabled the processor will have to go to that in to service that interrupt it's a non maskable it is not a maskable interrupt you can't stop you can't stop the oscillate you can't stop the processor from going to that particular interrupt so if there is, if the if the if the oscillator off is not used that is if OSC off equals to 1 this is a single bit if this is equals to 1 which means that you 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 have not switched off the oscillator and if the system understands that there is some kind of fault I'll explain how and where uh, if the system understands that there is some kind of fault with the clocking system what it will do is it will simply uh, it will simply latch the oscillator fault flag uh, that is uh, OSC OF IFG flag as far as I remember I'll see it I'll see it in the register and that flag once that flag is high and if and if you interrupt and in, and if you enable the oscillator fault interrupt uh, that is uh, oscillator fault interrupt enable if you make it equals to one then the processor will service the interrupt service routine you can't stop it now in the interrupt service routine it's up to you you can write a code to to log a data in the EEPROM or, or or somewhere in the memory or maybe you know send an SMS over the GPRS or whatever um, that there is some kind of some kind of problem that is there in the in the in the crystal and the beauty of the thing is you will ask me well the core is not working the oscillator is at fault so how can I how can I send the data to the EEPROM or how can I send the data to the to the GPRS modem or maybe to the Zigbee or to the Wi-Fi module now the beauty of MSP430 is once it feels that the oscillator is at fault it automatically switches to the DCO 
that is the DC control oscillator and, and, and that will that that takes around one or two microseconds to settle so within one or two microseconds your your core switches from LFXT1 CLK to the DCO that is DC control oscillator which is the internal oscillator and it and log and will carry on working unless and until this this particular problem is solved and this LFXT1 CLK starts working and then you again reset the system and then the system switches back to the external crystal so that is something very important and very interesting feature uh, here you can see one more bit that is XT1 off right this is nothing but you know if, if you don't need XT1 for some reason you can keep it off to save power now I'm coming to XT2 XT2 is an optional you can see you know it is within the dotted brackets it is it is within the dotted brackets because uh, XT2 is uh, is an optional section it is not present in all the microcontrollers of the X2 XX family so XT2 what you do is you connect an external crystal and uh, XT2 uh, if you this XT2 off is again you know if you want to keep the XT2 section off then you set this bit equals to 1 but like we had XT1 off over here over here so if you if you want to keep it off then you put this bit equals to 1 otherwise uh, it will keep on oscillating and XT2S this is uh, this is controlling the frequency of the XT2 oscillator and then the output comes to this particular section minimum minimum pulse filter that is it filters the pulse that is coming out of the XT2 block and one th one interesting thing is that you can see is that connected only when XT2 no is not present on the chip so what it is saying is that this XT2 system if it is not present on the chip only then this line this particular line how can I show you the line anyways uh, this arrow what it is showing is the clock from this section that is LFXT1 CLK and VLO CLK is also connected with XT2 output you can see over here here is VLO CLK here you have LFXT1 CLK and this is the output right the output is connected also to the XT2 output so this connection is done only when XT2 chip is not present otherwise this connection is not done you know this this X this this LFXT1 CLK or VLO CLK output comes directly over here this this joining uh, this joining section is not there it directly enters the 11 one section so selecting SELM as 11 will go to LFXT1 CLK or VLO CLK as you select over here okay I know I am going through very complicated theories if in case you have any kind of question please 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 feel free to write me a mail or uh, if if the question is very very big or it is very complicated to write you can send always send me a video or you know you can you can directly uh, send me a voice record uh, so so that I can listen to your question but I need to know I need to know your feedback okay so you can do it in the YouTube channel you can do it in my website directly as you wish but you must understand the, the clocking that is this one one is connected with one zero only when XT2 is not present if XT2 is present then what happens is this direct this LFXT1 CLK directly goes to one one XT2 goes to one zero and 0, 0 and 0, 01 they are connected with DCO okay now one thing more DCO is also connected to 10 that is not avoidable even if XT2 is not present 
DCO, one thing you must realize is that DCO is present in all the three combinations that is 00, 01 and 10. Because MCLK is the main clock or the main system clock. MCLK must function whether MCLK must function whether your XT2 fails or XT1 fails or if VLO CLK fails. That is the reason why DCO CLK is connected to all the three inputs. But LFXT1 is exclusively connected to 1 1, right? When XT2 is present, and if XT2 is not present, then it is shorted with 1 0. So selecting 1 0 can either, uh, can either, you know, if you if you select 1 0, if if you configure 1 0, if you select 1 0 over here as your clocking source for MCLK, then it can either come from DCO. It can I sorry I'm sorry if you select one zero it can either come from uh, your uh, LFXT1 CLK or it can also come from XT2 right now this particular section that is the out that is whether that is the output of the LFXT1 CLK or XT2 goes to this part why it goes to this part I will tell you later on because when I go to the subsystem clock so I hope this is uh, now now clear to you how XT2 functions so XT2 input directly goes into 1 0 okay and it also is it is it's also connected to LFXT1 CLK and it is also connected to one input of SLS what is SLS I'll tell you later on now once you have configured this particular bit these two bits that is say if you select say uh, one zero that is you are selecting um, say let us presume that you don't have you don't have uh, xt2 if you don't have xt2 then obviously one zero and one one both will be connected to lfxt1 clk so if you have used lfxt1 clk okay and if you have connected some crystal in the x in and x out then the party then that particular say 20 megahertz then 20 megahertz will come over here and it will come to both the inputs 10 and 11 so if you set SELM this cell M by now you must have understood that cell M X means that X stands for 0 and 1 or maybe more that depends on the number of bits that are that that is available here there it, it's it's a two bit configuration so it will be SELM SELM 0 and SELM 1 so according to these two bit combination if you if you set as uh, 1 0 then that clock 20 megahertz clock as I told you which is coming from here it will move into this divider now again you have a divider you will ask me why the point is sometimes you might not need the very high frequency of 20 megahertz to be used for your main system clock now the point is again why fine say your system is working at 20 megahertz right now if I haven't covered that section uh, actually MSP430 has a wonderful you know frequency versus power supply profile that is uh, the more frequency at which your core operates the more power supply you need okay so if your if your core is working at a lower frequency you can make it work you, you can operate it at even 3 volts or even I think 2.8 volts okay so <clears throat> So the lower frequency you use, the lower power your CPU will consume. But usually people don't divide this. So DIVMX again means that DIVM0 is this first bit and DIVM1 is the second bit. Now here you have a very interesting feature which is called CPU off. What is CPU off? CPU off, you know, it's like uh, CPU off is kind of a 
um, you know it's it's a kind of a switching off technique if you make CPU off then the entire power entire power consumption of the CPU goes to zero but then what is the reason why you should make the CPU go to off state the reason is you know if see if you make CPU off equals to one then you can see that it what it does is it simply cuts off the clocking the, the zero is connected with the clock source and one is connected with nothing so it simply you know puts the clock thing off it just doesn't clock the CPU so what happens is what well, if the CPU doesn't get a clock it doesn't operate and if it doesn't operate there are millions of transistors and millions of of, uh, of you can say capacitors and uh, and many you know um, many MOSFETs maybe might be there and uh, MESFETs may be there and many other you know electronic um, components that are that is actually doing your your arithmetical logical work inside so once they are all switched off or they are not working your power consumption goes down now the point is why do you want to make the power consumption go down or the CPU put to put to, to be put off for operations which are for 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 devices or circuits that are operated by battery they need this feature very much you know you don't need the CPU to be running on a you know we all love to write a program inside a infinite while loop and you know keep on waiting keep on waiting keep on waiting suppose if you have made a very simple thing say a clock how much time does it require for a clock to read the D to, to read the RTC and update the LCD <coughs> or the LED <coughs> or the <coughs> or the or the output display device once once in a second once in one can have you ever ever have you ever imagined a crystal of even one if even if you're using a one megahertz crystal right then a one megahertz crystal how many clock cycles is wasted for just you know reading the RTC and displaying it on the L, on the LED or LCD so what the CPU off feature will do is it will keep the it will keep the CPU off just when your uh, your but your timer module is on so this is the beauty you know this keeping CPU off doesn't mean that the timer module is not is 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 also switched off and the, and and I and I'll tell you the why you know TI has made all these kind of different clock architectures of ACLK MCLK SMCLK so when you put the CPU off you know MCLK goes to zero that is the main clock main system clock is off so what will happen what will happen is that the CPU goes to sleep mode but the timer which is keeping track of the time you can power the timer from either ACLK or you can also power the timer from SMCLK so when you power up when you power the timer module from SMCLK that is not off that is on so the timer keeps on you know that the timer keeps on uh, keep uh, you know it keeps on counting um, the time and just and when you know it becomes one 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 second is complete it will generate an in an internal interrupt okay so just when the internal interrupt is occurs it will automatically you know clear this CPU of bit so the CPU of bit is cleared and the zero is selected the main uh, the main uh, clock system powers on and the CPU does its work it updates the LCD and at the end of the routine you have to again put the CPU off equals to 1 to make it go to sleep so in this way you can save the, the power of the system you can save the power of the of the battery and also you can you can extend the life of the microcontroller also to some extent okay so this is all that you need to know about the main clock uh, now let us come to the most important part that is the that is the that is the DCO now as I told you the microcontroller first starts, first starts off from DCO after starting off from DCO it first checks OF IFG flag that is the oscillator fault flag if the oscillator fault flag is is there um, then it you know uh, and if you have the interrupt is enabled then it will automatically go into the NMI and, and report that there is a fault with the oscillator but we have to remember 
that whenever you power on a mac an, an, an MSP430 microcontroller the oscillator fall flag will obviously be one okay so if you are operating from DCO and your NMI is not enabled and if your NMI is not enabled so you don't have to bother it can, it can continue working on the DCO but if you want to switch from DCO to LFXT1 CLK or XT2 then there are some things that you need to do I will explain it a bit later on now let me explain what it what the what is actually DCO DCO is nothing but a DC controlled oscillator you know it is a DC it, it has a DC generator that is uh, that is uh, basically I would very simply I would put it as as a clock pulse generator right it is a clock pulse generator that is controlled by DC voltage and it it, it will it will generate uh, square wave pulses um, to proper accuracy that is that is very very much okay for you and your work to be done but if you require extreme accuracy then I would prefer go for external crystals because DCO um, you know DCO can never give you the exact frequency that you want there will be some kind of uh, you know there will be some kind of uh, shifts from the, the frequency you want uh, the reason being that you know this, this, this DCO operates in step frequencies step frequencies means that there is maybe a frequency of 999.98 megahertz and there may be the next frequency available is uh, one uh, uh, sorry 99 I'm sorry uh, the first the first frequency av is available is say is of 0 0.997 megahertz and the next frequency available is say 1.056 megahertz but you need one megahertz accurately so in that case it is very difficult to obtain the frequency from DCO but in most of the general cases you can very well use the DCO you can save two pins you can save external component costs and use pin number 2.6 and 7 for any kind of use GPIO buttons inputs outputs everything right so now what you see is you can use an external oscillator that is ROSC that is you can use an external oscillator into the DC generator but that we hardly use so what we will do is the DCO that is a decor register the decor register what it will do is the decor register the decor register what it will do is it will select whether you are providing the external frequency from any uh, from any timer or you want the DC generator to operate from the VCC that is a supply voltage well usually we all use the VCC and at least I have never used external oscillator in any of my projects the next thing that you need to know is SCG, SCG0 right the SCG0 will make the DC generator go off now the MSP430 to 2XX or any 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 MSP430 platform they have something a beauty they have a beauty of you know there's a beautiful thing that's called the low power mode they have beautiful low power modes I tell you they have beautiful low power modes there's LPM0 there's LPM1 there's LPM2 there's LPM3 there's LPM4 there's LPM 3.5 in some devices higher end devices 4XX series they have LPM 4.5 and I think there is also LPM5. So in you know in step by step you can you can switch off uh, sections of your controller and you can drop the power consumption to nano to nano amperes. It's almost nothing. So SC, SCG0 is a bit which when turned on will switch off your DCO. If you don't need the DCO, of course, you can switch off the DCO, right? Now you will say then 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 how will how will my controller work? Well, again, if your main controller or the main processor is is being routed from the DCO, and you have the ACLK uh, connected to the peripheral or, and the timer, then the timer can very well operate from the ACLK, and the DCO can be switched off. Or even in cases where you know 
where you want to operate from external crystal like LFXT1 CLK then first the processor will start from DCO that you cannot change DI has fixed it it, it starts operating from DCO and then you have to write a bit of code to switch it to LFXT1 or XT2 but once it has switched to LFXT1 or XT2 you can put this SCG 0 is equal to 1 and switch off the DCO part because you don't need it anymore you are operating from external crystal but remember if there is a fault with your crystal the processor cannot switch back to DCO okay now there is a wonderful thing that I need to show you that is uh, this can you see these registers R cell X and DCO X you know they are nothing but uh, but they divide the DCO frequency into steps. How do they divide it into steps? I will show you. Look at this picture. Look at this picture. Now DCO has how many bits? One, two, three. It has total of this total of 8 bits right and your R cell has 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 a total of I think uh, 4 bits so basically basically your register select R E S R cell that this is called register select R cell has 4 bits what are they known as? R cell 0, R cell 1, R cell 2, R cell 3. So how many possible combinations of R cell can you have? You can have R cell 0, 0, 0, 0. Then you can have 0, 0, 0, 1. You can have 0, 0, 1, 0. You can have 0, 0, 1, 1. Right? You can have 0, 1, 0, 0. You can have 0, 1, 0, 1. And this will continue up till 1, 1, 1, 1. So if you count this, you will get a total of 16 combinations. That is from 0 to 15. And that is exactly why you can see that, that R cell X has 15, up to 15 you can go. Now, DCO selects the range of the frequency and R cell selects the base of the frequency that is if you select R cell equals to 0 then your starting range would be 100, 100 kilohertz so if you if you select R cell equals to 0 and DCO 0 DCO equals to 0 well also for DCO I didn't explain the DCO part uh, also for the DCO what will happen just make the fonts a bit bigger For the DCO, what will happen is the DCO has 8 bits. So it's DCO 0, DCO 1, DCO 2, and so on up till DCO 8. Uh, sorry, 7. So DCO will also have co how many combinations? This DCO 8. DCO0 to DCO8 can be achieved by making the 3 bits of the DCO as 0, 0, 0 for DCO0. So basically you have 3 bits for DCO, right? That is DCO0 uh, zero bit, DCO1 bit and DCO2 bit. So if you use a combination of 0, 0, 0 0 comma 0 not 0 comma rather it should be 0 0 0 this will select DCO 0 right if you use a combination say 0 1 0 this will select DCO 2 so say in in our in our in in this particular graph right in this particular graph if we select say DCO 0 
first. So that means you are located in the 100 kilohertz region or below that. Right? Or you are located in the 1 megahertz region. Or you are located in the 20 megahertz region. Now, where do you want the TCO to operate? This 100 kilohertz region or 1 megahertz region or, twen or 20 megahertz region will be selected by our cell. So here you see the R cell, R, there are many values of R cell, right? It's R cell 0, R cell 1, R cell 2, R cell 3, R cell 4, R cell 5, R cell 6, till R cell 15. So if you say R cell is R cell 0 by writing, uh, say, by writing the R cell bits as, we have already made DCO as 0, 0, 0. Okay, which is equal to which is equal to DCO zero. So once you make DCO zero, you select the frequency of 100 kilohertz or 1 megahertz or 20 megahertz, any one of the three. As you can see, because this is common area, you are under this particular area. Okay. So now, if you say that after this, if you put R cell RSEL bits as it's a four bit system I told you as 0 1 1 0 say now how much is 0 1 1 0 can you tell me it's 6 so what you do is you have R cell equals to 6 So R cell equals to 6 means that in which location are you located? So you, you have DCO0 and R cell 6. So R cell 6 is located somewhere, you know this is R cell 7. So R cell 6 has to be located somewhere here. Right? It has to be located somewhere here. So Making DCO0 and R cell 6 will make your processor run somewhere around say 900 uh, kilohertz or 800 kilohertz. I hope you can understand. I don't have any much better uh, system in my in my in my laptop to to locate the area, but I hope you can understand. So. This is why R cell is all about. I'll give you another example, then maybe it will be clear for you. Say for example, I said DCO, the three bits of DCO, I select it as, I select it as uh, 100. Zero zero. So how much is 100? Zero zero? It's 4. So when you select DCO as 4, you are located in this region in this region right so when you're located in this region now you have to go select the R cell to uh, to define the frequency of operation of the DCO so now you say okay I will select R cell as 7 so now what will happen is DCO4 means it is this region that is uh, it can be uh, you know it, 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 it is almost uh, near about 100 kilohertz 1 megahertz and 20, 20 megahertz and R cell 7 is you know R cell 7 is over here so R cell 7 this entire step you must understand one thing this entire step belongs to R cell 7 it is not that this is R cell 7, the before one, this part is R cell uh, 6, this is R cell 5, this is R cell 4, other R cell 3, R cell 2, R cell 1, R cell 0. No, this entire step is belongs to R cell 7. The stepping is for DCO. So DCO 4 under R cell 7 goes to the middle position where the, where the dotted line is. So your frequency of operation will be 1 megahertz. So that is how. R, R cell and DCO bits combine 
to give you the perfect frequency at the output. So that is how uh, your R cell bits and your DCO bits will be used to generate the frequency. There's something called the modulator. You don't have to worry about the modulator. You know the modulator is used for uh, for synchronization of the of one particular frequency selected by the DCO and the next frequency that is there. That is suppose if you select um, one one suppose if you select one megahertz. And the next one is say uh, around uh, 1.01 .01 megahertz. So um, it uh, for every 32 cycles, it will it will it will it will uh, it will make uh, it will make a punch of the next frequency. This helps the clocking system run smooth, so that you don't have to bother much about. What you need to know is the this R cell and DCOX, and both of them. You know uh, they will be sent to this DCOCLK. This DCOCLK will uh, will be routed. I told you to 0001. Both of them. That is, if you want the MCLK to run from DCO, so 0001 will help you select the DCOCLK, and then DCOCLK also enters into the SCLS. That is, select. Here, what is done is you have like main like the main system clock. You also have the sub main system clock. So for the sub main system clock, you can have two source of frequencies or two source of clocking. One is the DCO, and as you can see from SELS, you can also select if you select SELS equals to zero, then the DCO is sourced into the SMCLK. But if you select one, then it will again go to the XT2, right? It will again go to the XT2. So uh, XT2 is selected as a source of clock or clocking. Uh, in case if you are selecting SELS equals to one, and after that there's a divisor. If you want to divide the main the DC clock by, if you want to make it divisible by 2 or 4 or 8 and then after that there's a beautiful uh, switching that is SCG1 SCG1 will uh, again you know enable and disable the sub main clock so if you want so I hope you can understand one thing that you know if you put CPU off if you put uh, if you put uh, this thing off SCG0 off If you put SCG0 off and if you and if you put SCG1 off then your SMCLK is also off your DC generator is off your CPU is off so what happens is your main clock goes to off right your SMCLK goes to off your main clock goes to off you're only left with ACLK now for ACLK so what happens is your entire system is sleeping only auxiliary clock is there and the auxiliary clock can only only you know make it's, it, it, it only acts like a heartbeat simply it only acts like a heartbeat it only allows the processor to to assume uh, to accept some external interrupts wake up from sleep and then it will turn on everything on the DCO on the LFXT1 on XT2 on maybe and then SCG0 on first to turn on the DCO first it will turn on CPU off will make will be made one uh, zero for uh, turning on the CPU clock the main clock SCG0 DC generator will be switched on DCO will be on then SCG1 may will be made zero in order to switch on the submain clock one. So, so uh, these are the facilities. These are the facilities uh, that is there uh, in the particular processor. And uh, and 
this is mainly how you should you know configure the the, the the clock oscillator part of your of your particular MSP430 microcontroller there is nothing more than that I'll just brief you once again there are four there are four type of clocks that is VC, VLO CLK, LFXT1 CLK LFXT1 CLK is operated from from slow uh, crystals that is 32 kilohertz crystals when you have to make XTS equals to zero or it can also be operated from high frequency crystals when you have to make XTS equals to one or you can also use the XT2 which is a high frequency uh, high frequency oscillator or you can use the DCU now by default the processor when you when you switch on the system the main clock which is which actually runs the the CPU the main clock will always run from DCU it will start from DCU so after after it starts from DCU if you want to switch it to the LFXT1 CLK there's a, there's a small part of the code that you have to write it will go to LFXT1 CLK and if it sees that there is some kind of problem and the oscillator fault flag is on then it will uh, it will it will it will raise the oscillator fault flag and it will if you have the oscillator fault interrupt enabled it will go to the NMI non maskable interrupt it will log the problem that that logging party the program you have to write it will never log automatically and it has to clear the OF IFG flag that is the that is the oscillator fault flag otherwise you know it will it will keep on it will keep on interrupting and it will again come back to DCU so these are the main uh, clock parts and the DCO is the final part where you have to s first select the R cell X and the DCO X that is the R cell bits however whichever frequency you want uh, you can select it from there the beauty of MSP430 is you know inside the ROM inside the ROM of the MSP430 all the frequency uh, corresponding R cell and DCO values are loaded so that I will explain when I will program when I will when I will do a program to you suppose if you want to write <coughs> suppose if you want to configure <coughs> the DCO at 1 megahertz you don't have to go to the graph and find out how much should be the value of DCO bits and how much should be the value of RCL bits they are already there you just write the you just write the you, you just select the right uh, pro, the, the syntax and the right values uh, and it is already included in the header file so you don't have to worry about selecting them so I guess that completes the clocking section of uh, of this particular thing um, now your work would be to go through the rest part of the datasheet I have explained almost everything right here is the part which I was discussing that is the modulator DCO modulator is that modulation part that I told you it basically you know selects the upper DCO tap frequency and lower DC suppose if you have DCO if you have selected DCO 4 then it sel then the system by default uh, also selects the DCO 5 and it punches both of them and it creates a very stable frequency pattern so that all that you will find over here you don't need to bother you can have a you, you have a yeah, you have a formula a mixing formula which generates the particular frequency that you need and these are these are mainly you know very useful for systems which has uh, which has a possibility of high frequency or you know electromagnetic interference uh, in the in the area like if you're using it in in a high magnetic field or an electromagnetic application or if your system needs EMI EMC compliance then all these things is important for you otherwise for simple applications you don't have to bother uh, now if you want to source this is what I was telling you if you want to source the main clock from the crystal that is from XT2 or XT1 CLK then what you do is after the power up condition as they say after the power up condition the DCU CLK MCLK is automatically sourced from DCO CLK that is the DCO will automatically clock the main clock if required MCLK may be sourced from LFXT1 and XT2 that is if you want if if your if your demand wants because there's a limit of DCO above which it cannot go so what you do is you 
first is you turn on the crystal oscillator and select the appropriate mode so you have to turn on LFXT1 CLK or XT2 I hope you remember there were uh, one there there was a bit as uh, XT2 off so you have to uh, remove that off or X or LFXT1 off you have to remove that off and turn on the particular uh, clocking system which you want to use then you clear the OFIFG flag right that, that I will explain in the in the register part then you have to wait for at least 50 microseconds this is because you, you you have to give some time for the crystal to stabilize its its oscillation okay if you're using a 25 megahertz or 20 megahertz or 16 megahertz crystal you must give some time for the crystal uh, to stabilize on its oscillation and then you check that if there is any kind of oscillator fault if there is oscillator fault then again you have to clear the oscillator fault and again wait for 15 microseconds so that you know some crystals do take time to stabilize its oscillation I have seen in my in, in my experience you know crystals taking time up to 250 microseconds to stabilize its, its operation this happens over the year if you have the device you know uh, kept in a very remote location where it keeps on running day and night day and night so the crystal has a wear and tear so every time you power on the device this loop has to be run so once it once it feels once once the oscillator OA5G that is the oscillator fault flag okay it is oscillator fault flag once it doesn't uh, once it doesn't uh, you know uh, once the flag doesn't set which means that the oscillator is working fine your system will swap to the second mode once you swap to the second mode or you swap to the LFXT1 or L or XT2 then you know you must remember that you have to uh, you have you, 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 you have to switch off the DCO but I would say it is a very risky operation because in future if your if your DCO fails to operate uh, sorry your 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 external crystal fails then your system goes to halt okay here there is a assembly language I'm sure nobody uses assembly language right now although I'm a great fan of assembly language programming so what they're saying is that uh, you uh, you just you just turn you you put oscillator off flag you switch you you clear the oscillator off flag uh, that is BIC means you clear you clear the oscillator flag right in the system register so that oscillator is on then you you select uh, the XTS uh, as one this BCS CTL1 is a register where this XTS is located okay you make it in the high frequency mode that is you make XTS equals to one then you select the particular uh, frequency where in which you want your crystal to operate right LFXT1 I showed you LFXT1 SX that is S0 and S1 that selects the frequency in which the, your LFXT1 will operate and then you clear the OFIFG flag that is the oscillator fall flag I told you whenever you, 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 you switch on the microcontroller the oscillator fall flag will be equal to 1 that is by default so you have to clear it right and then give some delay this delay is given by uh, by this loop you know this 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 entire loop is for the delay so this delay is for that 50 microsecond that we've seen over here and then after that you check again that if the OFIFG flag has been set or not right so if it is uh, if it is not zero that is if it is one this J and Z over here means that if jump not zero which means that if the oscillator flag is not zero that is if it is equal to still equals to one which signifies which signifies that the oscillator is having fault and it is not stabilized as yet so you again jump back to the same loop that you clear the oscillator fault and you wait as I was telling you over here test OA 5G and repeat steps 2 through 4 so once it becomes zero then this condition fails this condition fails and then you can select the clocking 
source as SELM1 and SELM0 that is SELM1 plus SELM0 means that SELM bit 1 and bit 0 will be the combination that is SELM will be equals to 1 0 combination 1 0 combination if you, if you go to if you go back to the page you will see that SELM 1 0 combination is the LFXT1 combination so this is how you are going to select the the particular uh, clock system now one thing you must remember you know sometimes it happens that your system is running in LFXT1 in DCO and you and you are swapping to the two LFXT1 like just now I showed you now here an interesting thing happens as you can see that you know uh, this is the DCO CLK that is the DCO clock which is a very high frequency and your LFXT1 clock is very slow frequency so and your MCLK which is the memory clock is first sourced from LF from DCO CLK as you can see but once you switch it to the LFXT1 CLK it will not immediately follow the LFXT1 CLK you can see that LFXT1 CLK falls after the arrow after this curvy arrow LFXT1 CLK falls but my memory clock doesn't fall it waits and it waits until one complete cycle has been completed by LFXT1 CLK right and then it gets synchronized over here so the synchronization occurs after one complete cycle has been completed by the LFXT1 CLK it is not you know synchronized immediately so these small things you have to you don't need to know this but these small things you must remember now these are the clock registers that you must know by heart I'm very sorry to say you must know by heart uh, you have to know the register bits which needs to be set and which is required for uh, the perfect operation of the clock system now in this video I'm ending the video right now because uh, for the reason that um, the register configuration can only be done after you go through this part of the chapter very very clearly okay so I'm giving you time uh, I will I will I will definitely uh, upload the register configuration but I will I will do it mm, I will do it after some time maybe today or tomorrow but uh, but it, it will be done in a separate uh, session not with this because the register values needs to be understood and configured so uh, till then goodbye have a nice time and do go through all the details of this particular chapter 5 and uh, for any queries you can always write me down to tojashua at tojashuasworld.in and please subscribe to my channel in my youtube channel you will find a link in my website tojashuasworld.in on the right hand side you can find subscribe to my channel over there you can click and you can you will have a subscribe button not many people have subscribed to my channel i know but if you subscribe i will be benefited i will be able to give you more videos more tutorials uh, more free projects so please do subscribe if you like my tutorial please do subscribe to my channel so thank you for watching and best of luck happy coding